If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 53. And we're going to read through verse 11 of chapter 8. So John chapter 7, beginning in verse 53, and reading through verse 11 of chapter 8. And if you're able and willing to stand, then would you please stand in honor of the public reading of God's Word. John chapter 7, verse 53. This is what the word of the Lord says. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now our Father... There may be no more precious words that we could read on this Lord's Day than to hear from Jesus himself. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Some of us have partaken of that invitation. We have listened to Jesus. And because of his sacrificial death and triumphant resurrection, we have been able to walk away from the power of our sin, from the bondage to death, and we are freed in Christ. May it be so for all of us this day. May there be one someone who would turn away from their sin. Receive Jesus' invitation this day and by faith in him go and sin no more. We pray it in his name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Throughout the Gospel of John, as we've been looking over these last several weeks, we've been asking the question that Jesus asks in the first chapter. You remember that in John chapter 1, Jesus encounters two of the disciples of John the Baptist. And they come to him. They, they're wanting information. They're wanting to know where he's staying. They're wanting to know where the, whether there is room in his rabbinical practice for them to take up residence. And Jesus, seeing them coming their way, he says to them, he says, what do you want? And I contend that throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus asks that question over and over and over again as people encounter him. Jesus is regularly saying to people, what do you want? And I would contend that on this very day, Jesus is saying to you and Jesus is saying to me, what do you want? Because as we come to Jesus Christ, often we come with a motivation that isn't pure. We come in a manner that isn't righteous. We come seeking things that Jesus isn't about. We come wanting Jesus to make us healthy, wealthy, and wise. We come to Jesus wanting Him to give us wisdom and all knowledge. We come to Jesus wanting Him to do things for us. And Jesus didn't come into the earth for what He could do for us, what He could make us, what He could give us. Jesus came just to have a relationship with us. A relationship that is based on his work, his work upon the cross, his work in triumph over the grave. 
And so all of us, Jesus asks the question, what do you want? And in John chapter 1, Nathaniel and the other disciple of John the Baptist, what they wanted was information. And in John chapter 2, what the mother of Jesus, Mary, wanted was for the need of the moment to be met. She wanted wine at a wedding feast. In John chapter 3, we saw the story of Nicodemus. And you remember that Nicodemus wanted to talk about religion. In John chapter 4, four we saw the official who came to Jesus, whose son was under the point of death. And what he wanted was for Jesus to heal his son. In John chapter 6, we, we saw the crowds that had been fed by Jesus in the wilderness and what they wanted was bread. In John chapter 7, we saw the Pharisees come to Jesus and what they wanted was for him to go away. And this morning, scribes and Pharisees show up again in John chapter 8. And what they want is to know Jesus' view of the law. They want to know how Jesus interprets the Scripture. They want to know what Jesus would make of Moses' command concerning the committal of adultery. And this is a difficult passage for us to wrestle with because throughout the history of the Christian church, as much joy, compassion, grace, and confidence in the mercy of Christ as have been rendered from this passage, it nonetheless is filled with difficulty for us. In fact, if you open your Bible and you look at this passage, more than likely you have some indication that this passage, this particular set of verses from John 7 and 53 to 8 and 11 may or may not have been original to the Gospel of John. In the ESV that I read from, some of you are reading from, it, it, there's a bracket above the text and a, a, an inscription that says the earliest manuscripts do not have this particular story. If you have the old King James Schofield Bible, you probably have a, a, a footnote. And if you go down to the footnotes, you have a comment that this particular set of verses is not in some of the earliest manuscripts. And that's true. We're going to talk about that tonight. So I encourage you, if you find this story fascinating, come back tonight and we'll talk about the history of textual transmission and how we got this story and what does it mean for us. I, I want to say to you confidently this morning that as much as I am convinced that John 7, 53 through 8, 11 is not original to John's gospel, because it's not, it is an original story of Jesus. Significant reading that I've done this week in studying for this particular sermon convinces me that this is an original story from the earliest days of Christianity. It was a story that was widely circulated amongst the followers of Jesus and it was recorded and eventually came to find its place in John chapter 7. Now, if that's bewildering to you, it's okay. If you shake your head at that and go, I'm not exactly sure what he's saying, it's okay. I urge you, come back tonight, 6 o'clock, downstairs in the fellowship hall, and we'll talk about it. But John chapter 7, 53 through 8, 11, presents what may be one of the greatest stories in all of Scripture. Because we here see the heart of a compassionate Christ, who is not indifferent to the law, who doesn't belittle the teachings of Moses? Who doesn't take away the responsibility for sin? But who does call all people to recognize that the law is not completed in their payment for their sin. The law is completed in the finished work of Christ. And on the foundation of Jesus' sacrifice, we can go and sin no more. In John chapter 7, we read about the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. You remember this is an eight-day celebration, and the people of God have long been engaging in worship and celebration, remembering how God brought them through the, the wilderness wandering period of their life together. And now we come into John chapter 8, almost on the heels of that, seemingly at the end of that celebration. Uh, the story begins by telling us that Jesus has gone out to the Mount of Olives, and now he's coming back into the city. And this was his practice often when he stayed in Jerusalem. 
He wouldn't stay in the city at night. He would go out into the countryside. We remember in the week of Jesus' passion that he came back and forth to the city day by day. He would go two miles out of the city and stay in the village of Bethany where he had friends. You may remember them, Martha and Mary and Lazarus. That's why some people read John chapter 8 and they think that this is actually a story that took place in the Passion Week of Jesus. Maybe, maybe so. But let's take it in its context. As the fulfillment of that week of the celebration of the tabernacles, the Feast of the Tabernacles, and here Jesus has come back into the temple. You remember from John chapter 7 that the crowds are gunning for him. The Pharisees and the scribes, all the leaders of the religious cult in Jerusalem, they, they have had enough of Jesus. Jesus in his teaching of Scripture, Jesus in his proclamation of the Word, Jesus in his interaction with people, he is uprooting their finely honed system of religion where they for centuries have been practicing their faith in a certain way, in a way that condemns the average person, in a way that exalts them as being superior morally to those around them. Jesus comes along and says, in fact, you are hypocritical in the way that you apply the law. You say that you are devoted to Moses. You say that the law matters. You say that there's nothing more important, but you are not consistent in the way that you meet out the word of Scripture. And this causes an uproar. Jesus has also been engaged in all sorts of wondrous activities. Remember that by now we have seen and heard about Jesus doing various miracles. We, of course, saw in John chapter 2 that Jesus did his first miracle at Cana in Galilee at a wedding where he turned water into wine. We remember in John chapter 4 that Jesus healed the son of the official who was sick and he did it from a distance. You remember in John chapter 6 that there was a crowd of some 5,000 people who were assembled in a wilderness in a desert place and Jesus Christ took loaves and fish and blessed them and multiplied them so that the crowds were filled to satisfaction and running over. Jesus has done so many wondrous works by now that the crowds are beginning to be enamored with him. They are wondering who is this Jesus? Who exactly is this one who, who is an authoritative teacher? This one who is a miracle worker? This one who is a powerful healer? And a debate arises. We saw in John chapter 7 that they are wondering, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? And there are those who say he couldn't be the Christ. We know where he's from, and we won't know where the Messiah is from when he comes. And there are others who say he's got to be the Christ. What more could the Messiah do than what this man has done to prove that he is who he says he is? And all of that boils down to resentment and bitterness and anger in the hearts of the leaders of the religious cult in Jerusalem. The priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they've had enough of this Jesus fellow. And remember last week that they were plotting to arrest Jesus, but they were afraid of the crowds. The only reason they don't have him arrested is because they're afraid they're going to have a mutiny on, his, on their hands that the mob will turn against them. But they are seeking the end of Jesus' life. They think they've got it. They've probably met in the middle of the night during this week of the Feast of Tabernacles, had a little conversation amongst themselves. They've gotten their best minds together and talked about how, how could we get Jesus? How could we pin something on him? How can we make sure that when we bring charges against him, they're going to stick? And somebody says, now this is paraphrase, this is, this is my interpretation, this is not in the book. But I think somebody said, I know a woman who regularly steps out on her husband. I know a man who regularly steps out on his wife. We could use the case of adultery to pin Jesus down. Not a hypothetical case. Not a what if. Not in this instance. But a real, live case. They arranged it. I'm convinced they arranged it. I'm convinced this was a trap set for Jesus. John says as much when he says that they were angling to destroy him. 
They get together, they plot this thing out, they set the trap so that when Jesus comes back into the temple on that day at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, the crowds are drawn to him. Did you see that? All the people go to him to hear him teach. And he teaches with authority. Not the authority of men, mind you. In fact, the scribes and the Pharisees that we heard at the end of John chapter 7 saying about the crowds that they are ignorant, they're unlearned, they don't know the scriptures. They're the same ones who said that Jesus must be this hick from a backwater who doesn't know the Bible. Not because he doesn't know Hebrew, not because he isn't acquainted with the law of Moses, but because he has not had formal rabbinical training. When they accuse Jesus of being unlearned, what they're accusing him of is not an absence of knowledge about the scriptures. What they're accusing him of is not being trained in the ethical teaching of a local rabbi. They think Jesus must not have authority in his teaching because he hasn't gone through a formal process. And yet the crowds are drawn to him. And there in the courtyard of the temple, probably in the court of Israel, Jesus is teaching the crowds that are drawn to him, and up come the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes, that's a class of people, they, they were those who were trained to copy the scriptures, to interpret the scriptures, they were, they were those who could give deliberations and positions about what the law of Moses said. The Pharisees, they were a political class. They were the opponents of the Sadducees. And the Pharisees had a broader view of Scripture. They were more progressive in nature. They believed in a resurrection. The Pharisees and the, and the scribes team up, and they come against Jesus, and they say, we want to know how you view the law. We have here, as Exhibit A, a woman caught in adultery. Moses says in the law that we should stone her. What do you say? They are convinced that they have Jesus in a trap. They're certain that Jesus won't work his way out of this one. After all, if he should say that Moses is wrong, that we shouldn't put her to death, then what Jesus is really saying is that there's no authority in Scripture and the crowds will turn against him. And if he says we should put her to death in a practice that has not actually been followed for centuries by this point, a practice that the Romans have outlawed because no subjugated people have the right under the Roman Empire to put someone to death, that this practice both screams of anger and rage in the eyes of the people and of disobedience to the civil authority. In which case, Jesus will probably find himself run out of town on a pole. So they come to Jesus. They present exhibit A. And they say to him, we want to know your view of the law. I want you to see in the text this morning four realities of those who oppose Jesus. Four realities of those who oppose Jesus. The first reality of those who oppose Jesus is that they use people. Those who oppose Jesus use people. You see there in verse 53, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, of Moses, now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women, so what do you say? They said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Opponents of Jesus use people. The scribes and the Pharisees, they are not interested in the fulfillment of the law. The scribes and the Pharisees, they're not interested in a discussion of ethical practice. The scribes and the Pharisees are not interested in the purity of the people of Israel before a holy God. No, the scribes and the Pharisees are intent on the destruction of Jesus, and so they use this woman to get their way. I want you to understand, nowhere in the Scripture do we have in this story a, 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 an authorization of what this woman has done. 
Nowhere does Jesus or anyone else for that matter say that, that what she's done in committing adultery is not in fact a sin deserving of condemnation. And yet there is something about the way that the scribes and the Pharisees go about this that smacks of abuse. See, I'm convinced they set a trap. The reason I'm convinced of that is because of a few questions I have of this text. Number one, adultery is not exactly a sin that one can commit as a solo act. Where's the man? If they caught her in the act, they would have caught the man too. The fact that this woman is caught and brought before Jesus and the way that they speak of it, they don't even acknowledge the fact that there's another sinner involved. Seems to point to me that they are trying to use her. And I've always had this question, I bet you have too. How do you exactly catch someone in the act of adultery? Do you go peeping through windows? I, don't, I hope not. I think they set a trap. I think they knew somebody that stepped out on their husband or knew someone who stepped out on his wife and they decided to take advantage of the situation. We don't have to have a hypothetical. We don't have to have a what if. We can have a real, live case. Those who oppose Jesus abuse people. I can't help but in thinking about that to think of our own day and age. We have an issue even before us now, before the Supreme Court of the United States, concerning the practice of abortion. An attempt by the state of Louisiana to hinder the practice of abortion by requiring that physicians who practice abortion would have admitting privileges in order to save the life of a woman. Just recently, we had yet another attempt by some of our senators in the United States Senate to pass, a, pass legislation that would have protected the life of a child who was born through an abortion proceeding. And yet that law failed. We live in an age where people are so intent on the defense of a woman's right to choose that they abuse people. When you hear people talk about this issue, you hear people go to the extreme. You hear people cite the cases that are on the fringe. You hear people talk about those who, who get into a situation where the woman's life is at stake and, and we need to be able to take this child in the womb in order to save the life of the mother. We go to the extreme. But in running to the extreme and using that as the opportunity to justify this particular practice, this sin in the eyes of a holy God, we then open the door as a nation to slaughter any child with or without reason. See, those who oppose Jesus use people. But not only do those who oppose Jesus abuse people, but then we see that those who oppose Jesus manipulate the Scripture. Those who oppose Jesus manipulate the Scripture. You see there that they say to Jesus in verse 4, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 22 to 24, you'll find the passage that they're referencing. And it's interesting that the passage that they reference, number one, does not require stoning as the punishment for adultery. Now, if a, if a betrothed girl or betrothed young man engages in adultery, verse 22 of chapter 22 of Deuteronomy does require stoning. But for People caught in adultery, that means married persons engaged in sexual sin outside of the marriage covenant. It does require death, but it doesn't actually say that they're to be stoned. But there's more than that. Read verses 22 to 24 of chapter uh, 22, and what you find in the law of Moses is that not only is it required that the woman should be put to death, but it is also required that the man engaged in adultery should be put to death. They come to Jesus and they say to him, Moses in the law says, we've got to put this woman to death. We've got to stone her for adultery. What do you say? And if I were Jesus, the first thing I'd say is, well, actually, that's not what the law says. 
It's interesting that they leave that part of the law out. Interesting because when we read verse 7 in Jesus' interaction with these scribes and Pharisees, the way that he responds after his time doodling on the ground, Jesus seems to indicate that one or more of them have been engaged in the same sexual sin. They manipulate the scripture, and I think the reason they do it is to try to avoid culpability for themselves. Those who oppose Jesus use people. Those who oppose Jesus manipulate the word. Those who oppose Jesus, you see there, they, they hide their sins. Look at verse 6. It says they said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. Those who oppose Jesus hide their sin. See, Jesus has in mind, I think, Deuteronomy 13 and 9, 17 and 7, perhaps a passage in Leviticus 24. Jesus has in mind laws that require in the public execution of a person for the committal of grievous sin that the person who is the accuser, the person who is the witness, be the first to cast a stone. D.A. Carson, one of the great theologians of our time, says that here Jesus is not calling these men, these scribes and Pharisees, to an ethical standard of perfection. What he is requiring of them is that they be witnesses who are blameless in regard to this particular sin. That if they are going to throw the stone, if they are going to put her to death, if they are going to insist that the law be applied in this way to bring an end to this woman's life, then they too must be blameless of this sin. And then they must be willing to step forward and cast the first stone. Jesus seems to say it because they're hiding something. They're hiding their own sin. They've got a double standard. It's often that way in the case of sexual sin. The very fact that we have different biology proves that a woman is more likely to be found out of having engaged in sexual sin than a man is. And yet we will excoriate the woman, we'll put her to public shame, we'll condemn her and cast her aside while men hide in the shadows and often act like they have no responsibility in the matter. And Jesus refuses to allow such hypocrisy to stand. Instead, he confronts them with the reality that they are hiding their sin. Those who oppose Jesus, they use people. Those who oppose Jesus, they manipulate the scripture. Those who oppose Jesus, they hide their sin. But number four, those who oppose Jesus will not repent. You look there at verse 9. Jesus has bent down on the ground. He's taken time to think. He stood up and given them this command. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And as he is drawing once again, as he again is waiting, it says when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. In walking away, the scribes and the Pharisees acknowledge their sin. They're saying that they're guilty. They're saying that they have committed adultery. They're saying that they're complicit in this particular offense. But in walking away, not one of them is asking for the mercy of God. Understand this, brothers and sisters. You and I cannot, we cannot repent of our sin without first acknowledging that we are sinners. But just because we acknowledge that we are sinners does not mean that we've repented. Here, the scribes and the Pharisees, they look at Jesus. They listen to his words. 
They hear the conviction that they cannot stone this woman because they're guilty of the same thing. But it does not enter into their heart to seek the mercy of God. It does not enter into their heart to plead for His forgiveness. It does not enter into their heart to wait around and see how will Jesus interact with this woman. Maybe if He's gracious to her, He would be gracious to me. And it proves that those who oppose Jesus, not only do they use people, not only only do they manipulate the word not only are, are they unwilling to reveal their sin but those who oppose Jesus remain unrepentant and yet they want to know Jesus how do you interpret how do you view the law remember we said never in this passage does Jesus condone sexual sin Never does he make light of the Word of God. Never does he strip the law of its power. And so I want you to think this morning about four aspects, just briefly, four aspects of Jesus' interpretive decision regarding Scripture. Number one, how does Jesus view Scripture? Well, he views it carefully. Do you see there that when these scribes and Pharisees say to Jesus, Moses says that she's got to be stoned for adultery, what do you say? That he does not speak first? We live in a culture of talking heads, a culture of instant responses, a culture where we want an answer and we want it now. That is not the mindset of the Lord Jesus. When he interprets God's word, he does not do it flippantly. He doesn't do it in a hurry. He does it carefully. Do you see that he bends down to the ground and he begins to draw, he begins to write, he begins to process. We'll talk about that tonight. Jesus is taking time. He's thinking through his response. He's recalling the word of scripture. He, he's doing like so many of us do in these times. He's saying, now what was that reference again? Oh yes, Deuteronomy 22, 22 to 24. He's got it. He's processing it. He's thinking through it. He's recalling what he inspired as the living word. Jesus interprets Scripture carefully. But number two, Jesus, he, he interprets Scripture confidently. Confidently. Jesus says to the scribes and the Pharisees, he says to them, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Do you understand that when Jesus says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, Jesus is saying that the woman deserves death. Jesus is saying that the law does apply. Jesus is saying that in this particular case, the woman who has committed adultery is deserving of condemnation. So if we're going to apply the law, if we're going to uphold Scripture, if we're going to stand where it stands, then we've got to mete out justice here. Jesus doesn't strip the law of its power. Jesus doesn't do like so many preachers do in our own day and try to skirt the word of God in order to appease the crowd. He's confident. The law says one who's committed adultery deserves to die. Let's apply the law in this way. Let him who's without sin cast the first Jesus, he interprets scripture, he does so carefully, he does so confidently, then I want you to see he does it compassionately. It says in verse 9 that when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. Y'all know why, right? Because those who are older have more sins stacked up. They know the lifetime and the practice of immorality. They know that they can't possibly get away with being innocent of these charges. It says that they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And then it says in verse 10 that Jesus stood up and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Had Jesus had in his mind a desire to destroy as the only righteous one in the crowd that day, 
he could have then turned to the stones and begun hurling them. Would have been absolutely justified. But instead, in his interpretation of Scripture, he's compassionate. It's not that Jesus Christ is unwilling to take the stand upon the Word of God. It's not that Jesus Christ is undercurting, uh, under, underpowering the Word. It's not that He's stripping it of its authority. It's not that He's saying that isn't it true. But He is taking it, and in His application, in His interpretation, as He brings it to bear on this particular situation, He's confident in His authority, but He's compassionate in His ministry to the one who's broken the wall. But there's one last thing about Jesus' interpretation of Scripture, and this is the most important thing. When Jesus views the law, he doesn't view it as complicated. He views it as complete. When Jesus views the law, he does not view it as complicated. He views it as completed. That is a confident thing for us. That, that is an inspiration of hope for us because sometimes we open the law of Moses and we begin to read difficult passages. We wrestle with hard truths. We look at the call to holy living and we know that we cannot measure up. We know that we can't be holy. We know that we can't keep the law. And we might think to ourselves, what are we supposed to do? And Jesus comes along to say, it's all done. See, Jesus says to the woman, is there anybody around to condemn you? And she says, no one, sir. And Jesus says to her the most tender words, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. He doesn't say that to her because a price doesn't need to be paid for her sin. He doesn't say that to her because she's not a sinner. He doesn't say that to her because the law of Moses is somehow no longer in effect. He says that to her because Jesus completes the law. When Jesus says to this woman, neither do I condemn you, it is a foretaste. It's a foreshadowing. It's a way of indicating that he is going to stand in her place. That he will bear the weight of her sin. That he will pay the price that she owes. That he will die the death that she deserves. And that because he will triumph over the grave, she can walk away in freedom. The scribes and the Pharisees came to Jesus wanting to know how do you view the law. And Jesus responded, I don't view it as complicated. I view it as complete. Because Jesus Christ has died and been raised, every one of us can hear and respond to that invitation. Neither do I condemn you Go, and from now on, sin no more. The person who struggles with anger, the person who struggles with anxiety, the person who struggles with bitterness, the person who struggles with addiction, the person who struggles with, with, with gossip, the person who struggles with grief, the person who struggles with all manner of sin, the abortionist, the alcoholic, the drug addict, the sexual sinner. Every one of us can respond to the invitation of Jesus because he views the law not as complicated, but as complete. There came a day in my life when I realized that I didn't have to keep the law of God. In fact, I couldn't. But Jesus had kept it for me. He paid the price by dying upon the cross. He freed me from the bondage to sin and death by rising from the grave. 
And if I would turn and put my trust, my faith, my hope, my dependence on Him, then I could walk away from the bondage of my sin in freedom. Freedom that is in Christ. Some of you are here today and you have the same testimony. You've come to the end of yourself. You've seen the hope of glory. You know that you can't pay the penalty for your sin, but Jesus has paid it all. And so you have walked in freedom from your sin. You've taken Him up at His invitation and you've gone and sinned no more. But I wonder this morning, might there be someone who is here today who has never walked in freedom from their sin? Someone today who says, I know that I've got to do it on my own. Someone who says, I I've got to make it on my own. Someone who says, I've got to keep the law on my own. Someone who says, I I don't understand it all, but I feel like I've got to in order to be right before a holy God. And I want you today to understand that Jesus Christ says to you, you a sinner, you who have broken His law, you who deserve death and judgment for all time, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You ought on this very day to turn in trust that what Jesus did is enough so that the law of God against you is settled and so that he welcomes you into his presence for all.